Hello everyone, welcome back to the IXP Manager video tutorial series. What I'm going to be looking at in the next few videos is going to be about configuring root servers with IXP Manager. And in this first part, what I want to do is just take the time outside of a standard presentation or webinar where time might be constrained to just go through uh, at maybe a bit more of an easier pace what root servers are, why we need them, why they're important, and why IXP Manager um, is what why they're such a part, uh, such a central part of what IXP Manager does. So, just a quick recap on some of the things that we would have mentioned in other series and other videos. Um, when you when you add a member to IXP Manager, and when you add an interface for that member, a, a connection to the peering LAN. That enables XP Manager to auto provision a huge amount of things for you at your internet exchange. Some of these things are, for example, a root collector, uh, the root servers that we're going to look at here, all of the graphing and the peer to peer graphs, smoke ping for measuring latency, Nagis monitoring, AS112 BGP sessions, reverse DNS, uh, the IRI. Or I or data uh, AS set and ASN objects and a lot more stuff. In fact, at INEX, you know, we we auto provision our switches from IXP Manager. So there's a huge amount of things that that you can pull out of IXP Manager once you have the members information in there. So, what is a root server? A root server is a third party brokering system, and it's used to provide a multilateral interconnection via BGP. What that means is that normally in BGP, you have two peers that create a bilateral session with each other and one advertises their routes to the other and vice versa. And that's a that's a one to one uh, a unilateral uh, or sorry, excuse me, a bilateral uh, interconnection with BGP. The problem at an Internet exchange is that once you join it, there may be 10 or 50 or 100 or 300 other members. And it's very hard to go around and knock on all of those doors and try and get a network engineer in each of those organizations to configure a bilateral BGP session for you. So it just doesn't scale uh, as, an IXP, as an IXP grows. So what a root server does is it provides a multilateral uh, way of doing that so that as you, when you peer with the root server and advertise your routes, the root server will propagate those to all of the other members and vice versa, all of the other members' routes to yours. Just in, as an example of why this doesn't scale, you know, if you only, if you only had 10 participants at your exchange and you wanted a full mesh where everyone peers with everybody, you're only talking 45 sessions there. Uh, and in fact, with 10 participants, each participant just needs to go and knock on nine doors. It doesn't seem very onerous, but as this scales, it's not linear, it's exponential, really. Um, you know, the 100 participants will, will, will create nearly 5,000 BGP sessions if everyone was to peer with everybody else. It means if you're the 100 member of the exchange, you have to go and contact 99 other members to get peering with everybody. Of course, not everybody is going to peer at the root server. Many peers will have uh, a selective policy, for example, IP transit providers or large CDNs, and that's absolutely fine. If as a new member, I can come to, to an exchange that has 100 members, and through the root server, if I can get access to 80 of them, which is a typically uh, how many people you get on your root server, 80 plus percent, I'd imagine, uh, that's a huge win for me on day one. It's a huge amount of traffic on day one just by setting up peering sessions with the root servers. This is just a graphical representation of what I was talking about there. You can see on the left we've got eight routers, eight members, uh, and the, the lines would show how many bilateral BGP sessions would be required for a full mesh uh, um, peering at, uh, without root servers. On the right, you can see with the root server cluster, each member only needs two sessions, one to each root server. So it's, it's vastly simplified. Um, routes that are announced by one root server client, one participant, one member. So routes that are announced are forwarded to all of the other participating clients. So that's what we mean by multilateral. When I advertise a route in, that route gets sent to all of the other participating clients of the root server. One thing that's really important about root servers is they do not forward traffic. They're not a router. They simply exchange the routing information. And in fact, they do it in a way that they don't even insert their AS number into the AS path, which is really important because typically in the BGP best path selection algorithm, the, the most important thing is the number of AS hops between uh, your network and the destination network. And if the root server was sticking its AS number in, 
uh, it would make it look as if there was an extra network to go through when in reality there isn't. Uh, even more so, you know, th that's one example of what, why root servers are transparent. They also, when you tag or your, when, if you community tag your roots or add communities to your roots, they will be passed on uh, untouched transparently by the root server. Uh, there's a couple of RFCs that um, that define root server operations. That's RFC 7947 and 7948. They've been written by a number of people, including our own the Killiard at Inex. So root servers today are considered a production level service, which is to say that uh, at an exchange, two of the most important things are the, the availability of the peering LAN itself. Can traffic get from one member's port to another? and the resilient resiliency, reliability, stability of the root servers. So the peering LAN and the root servers are the two most important things in an internet exchange these days. So they're very, it's very important that they're um, provisioned resiliently and that they're well configured. You gotta remember, you know, when we're talking about, about threats here, what what your exchange is providing is for a way of, is a way for one member to advertise a route and have that route sent to every other member of your exchange. If that route is bad, whether maliciously or not, you're going to propagate that to all of your other members. So as an exchange, you have a huge responsibility to configure your root service correctly. Now, as I say, threats can be malicious or accidental. The vast, vast majority, 99 plus percent, are purely mistakes. They're pebcac, they're fat finger, they're just a, a poor network operator, we've all been there, who's made a mistake, uh, and they've ad advertised a default route or a default free zone route leak or something else uh, into the exchange. So they, they are typically accidental. They can be malicious, but they are typically accidental. The kind of threats that, that, that you know we, we want to stop is things like a route leak. And that can be a, a default route. It can be a default free zone, so the entire routing table. Or it could be someone trying to maliciously advertise the routes of a network that they're trying to get traffic, maybe a financial institution. They're advertising their routes and trying to grab that traffic over the exchange. Next hub hijacking is something we might look at in, in part two. Uh, and then of course there's also root server software bugs. So there's a number of threats and, and there's far more as well. And as I say, when we step through all of the uh, inbound filtering that we do, we'll, we'll go through the threats in a bit more detail. So let's talk about hardware for a second. When you're considering building root servers at your exchange, what kind of hardware do you want? Well, for an IX carrying significant traffic, and, and by significant, what I mean here is, is anything that's considered important. If you're a startup exchange with three or four members, uh, and there's another exchange or uh, in, in your vicinity that they're all members of as well, or you know that you're just a really small startup uh, and, and reputation isn't at risk, uh, well, that probably isn't significant. Okay? But any time where you have a significant traffic, ideally what you want is two servers. And if your exchange spans two or more points of presence, you want to make sure you put uh, uh, separate those servers into two different points of presence. Uh, of course, these need to have dual power supplies, A and B feed, just like your switches. This is critical infrastructure for your exchange. Um, in terms of, of you know, power CPU RAM, that really is going to become dependent on the size of your exchange. But I would say that for you know anything up to you know 80, 100 members, a you know a, a standard off the off the shelf four core CPU with 16 gig of RAM will certainly see you through. The storage requirements for a root server are really low. Uh, 30 gigs is even excessive. You know it's it's really a very basic operating system running one piece of software. Uh, there isn't even that many logs that are generated. Um, we typically recommend that you you that you do use virtualization, um, even though like these these two physical servers. The purpose of them should really just be to run your root servers. Now, if you're a smaller exchange, there's no problem having the root servers as well as other uh, virtual machines on the same boxes. You don't need to go out, spend a fortune on, on dedicated hardware, as long as you can be you can be assured that the physical hardware is going to be uh, stable uh, and, and, and resilient. Uh, the reason to virtualize your root servers is because it makes maintenance really, really easy. Um, let's say you have a maintenance window to upgrade from uh, maybe Bird 2.05 to 2.07, for example. Uh, what you can do offline in advance of the maintenance window is, is clone your production uh, root server. You can do all of your upgrades and your tests offline, unconnected to the peering LAN. And then, you know, once the maintenance window kicks in, you, you take down your BGP sessions, you shut down the old server, 
the old virtual machine and then you you switch the network interface and your new virtual machine into your peering LAN uh, and everything should just come up. Uh, and then if you need to roll back, you just do the reverse. You just take it back out of the peering LAN and bring back up your older your older server. The physical box should have a direct connection to peering LAN if possible, and it should have a separate management interface. In terms of software, um, you know there there really is isn't a lot of of software um, that would that I would consider particularly suitable for root servers, and and the ones that really are is is Bird version one and now Bird version two, and really you want to go with B Bird version two for full or PKI support, um, Open BGPD, um, and 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 Go BGP. Although I don't have myself have a lot of experience on that. Um, you don't need to go out and buy a hardware router like a Juniper or Cisco for root server functionality. Um, so you really just need a, a you know, a, a, a standard server with one of those pieces of software. Uh, ideally, you'd like to have two different software stacks. And for years, we ran, you know, Quagga and Bird side by side. Um, it, it's quite difficult now because for various reasons, uh, Quagga... Um, didn't keep pace with root server development, so Bird was the only game in town for a long time. OpenBGPD has had a huge amount of work put into it, and we hope to have IC Manager supporting that sometime in 2021. But for now, for example, at INEX, we run Bird version 2 uh, on both of them. So needs must. It, ideally, there'd be two different software stacks, but that can't always be the case. So without two different software stacks, what you want to have is a really cautious approach to software updates. Which is to say, you know, if you if Bird has a new version, upgrade one of them, wait a few weeks, unless it's a security problem, uh, then upgrade the other one. Uh, there's this this kind of tongue twister, idempotent atomic session based configuration merge. What that really means is that the software you choose, you want it to be able to support a complete replacement of the configuration and a reload. In the old days, we used to pipe configuration to Quagga. And the problem with that is uh, because IP Manager ISP Manager doesn't maintain state, Quagga wouldn't delete the old peers, which was a real pain. So what you want is something like Bird, where you can essentially download a complete full configuration file and just tell Bird to reconfigure itself. So it's just a complete replacement of the configuration and off you go. Uh, you definitely want to support for efficient handling of large prefix sets, of RPKI, large communities, etc. And Bird ticks all those boxes. Uh, particularly in ISP Manager, Bird 2 is what you want to use nowadays, and that is that fully supports every feature that we're going to look at. The plan, as I said, is to support OpenBGPD as well. That would have to be done on a on an equal basis, so we need we would need to have OpenBGPD supporting all of the features that we have in ISP Manager. Uh, and as I say, we'll see that over the next couple of couple of presentations. Okay, root servers in ISP Manager. I, I guess the question that I'm trying to answer in this slide is. Why should you trust us, uh, uh, you know, myself and Nick in particular at INEX, and why should you trust IP Manager to generate your root server configuration? Well, we've been doing it since 2007. Um, Nick has co-authored some of the RFCs that I mentioned earlier on. We have given countless presentations, workshops, tutorials, not just on root servers, but on, on, on Internet Exchange Points, on, uh, on, on you know, workshops for, for client-side BGP configuration, uh, and so on. Uh, we at INEX our and with Ice Manager, our root server configuration has always been automated. No one at INEX has ever logged into a root server to deploy manual configuration. That's just not something that you want to have to do, especially in a production environment. And ours have always been secured with prefix filtering. So our root servers since 2007 have been secured day one with uh, prefix filtering. And all of this experience and all of this knowledge has been distilled into ISP Manager and the configurations that we release. So I hope that hope that helps explain why why you can trust us. <clears throat> this is a, a historic email I like to pull out now and again. It's from November 2007. Um, and it's uh, it's probably a year or two after I started at Linux, and it's from Nick Hillier, the CTO, to the membership. And what Nick was was doing was announcing the new root server cluster at INEX. And this email touches three or four actually four very important um uh, uh, points about root servers the first is about multilateral uh peering how it dramatically reduces the number of bgp sessions required to peer with other members at your exchange we've covered that already 
The second is strict root filtering on inbound announcements. Uh, and what Nick is saying is that this means that only prefixes registered at RIPE, in, in the case of INEX at the time, by exchange members would be visible. So that's our strict filtering, our secure inbound filtering. The third thing is this resiliency, dual hosted system offering high reliability. So there was two servers from day one and two different data centers. And then the last thing is what we look at now is community-based filtering. Uh, and I suppose the thing about root servers is that, uh, in fact, I think it probably on the next slide. <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, the thing about root servers is while you, you, you provide a huge amount of convenience to your members, you're also potentially taking away some control. When, when two members have a bilateral session with each other, they can do uh, they can do any amount of root filtering and, and you know, maybe only announce certain routes to that member, maybe announce um, uh, uh, more specific networks to that, to that, maybe announce meds and stuff like that. You take away a lot of that uh, when you use a root server. So you need to try and give some control back, especially to let more complicated networks uh, be comfortable using the root servers. We can't obviously replicate everything uh, like if you set a med the root server will transparently send that to all of the participants at the exchange uh, but for example uh, in in the current setup of the root servers you wouldn't be able to send one med to one member and a different med to everybody else but we do provide a, a huge amount of control about prefixes and, and ASPAP prefending using uh, well-known community uh, community filters so uh, what, what do I mean by community? I basically mean tagging your roots, your prefixes with a BGP community. So the on the screen here in front of you, uh, we've got a root map. Uh, this is a very simple uh, Cisco client side configuration. Uh, and I just want, I'm just trying to make sure that we're all on the same page. So what we're doing is we're setting a 16 bit um, community here uh, on any routes that are sent to 192.0.2.8, which in, in, in this example will be the root server. So this is how we set a community. And this, this is what we mean by communities. We just mean BGP uh, communities that are that are tagged on to prefixes. So there are well-known communities that have pretty much been agreed by most IXs, so they should be very familiar. Uh, and these are the standard communities. So if I wanted to prevent the announcement of a prefix to a particular peer that's also on the root server. I would tag my roots with zero colon and that peers AS number. If I wanted to announce a route to a certain peer, I would tag it with the root server AS number colon that peers AS. Now that seems a bit odd. Isn't that what the root server does anyway? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, but if you had tagged your roots with the next one, prevent announcement of a prefix to all peers, zero colon the root server AS, uh, then, it, then it wouldn't announce it to anyone and you would need to explicitly say which networks you wanted announced to using the announcer route to a, a certain peer uh, guy here. So I just have two examples. Sorry, the, the fourth one, root server ASN colon root server ASN. That's a no-op. Announce a route to all peers is essentially what the root server does by default. So if you have no tags, you are essentially saying this. Now, uh, two examples. If you wanted to advertise your prefix to no other participants except ASX, ASY, and ASZ, you would tag your prefixes with zero call on root server ASN. That's this one here. Prevent an announcement of a prefix to all peers. Uh, and then accept root server ASN call on X. So that's this guy here, root server ASN call on peer AS. That's to announce a route to a certain peer. So what we're saying is don't announce my route to anyone except AS, X, Y, and Z. If I wanted to announce it to everyone except two particular networks, so say except X and Y, I would just have to use this prevent announcement of a prefix to a peer, zero colon peer AS. So for the two networks, X and Y, I would tag my routes with zero colon uh, X and zero colon Y, where X and Y is that peer's AS number. So as I say, these are fairly standard, fairly agreed, and it, it, typically most IXPs will use the same uh, tags as this. Now, a few years ago, we've, we, we got uh, large communities. These are 32-bit, 32-bit, um, um, uh, so, sorry, a 16-bit community is a 16-bit number, colon a 16-bit number. Um, uh, Job Schneiders and uh, in particular, I think, um, got an RFC passed, which is now supported by most um, routers 
for large communities and that is a 32-bit number colon a 32-bit number colon a 32-bit number so it's a 32-bit triplet and that allows us to do a lot more things because in particular 32-bit AS numbers have become hugely popular in the last few years and with standard standard 16-bit community filtering we can't affect any 32-bit AS number so if I wanted to use the root server uh, I would not be able to prevent the announcement of my peers to anyone with a 32-bit AS number, as an example. Now, we can do that with large communities. So the, the structure of the large communities, they all start with the root server AS number. And then to prevent the announcement of the prefix to a peer, it's 0 colon peer AS. And to announce it, it's 1 colon peer AS. So you can see what's happening there. 0 is to stop, 1 is to announce. To prevent the announcement of a prefix to all peers, it's zero colon zero. So root server ASN colon zero colon zero. And then the opposite announce a root to all peers, root server ASN colon one colon zero. Again, this fourth one is a no op. This is what the root servers do by default. So this uh, these allow us to affect our to control our, our routing and the propagation of our routes to networks with 32 bit ASNs. So that's really important. Um, just a quick note here as well is that a root server client, so anyone using your root servers, they should not mix standard 16-bit communities and large communities. So they should use one or the other. Now, that's not in general. That's for trying to control uh, um, the propagation of the routes at the exchange. So they shouldn't try and mix the IX's standard communities with the IX's large communities. They can certainly tag their routes with any other standard communities and any other large communities all they like. Just in terms of the filtering, um, they should just choose one or the other, okay? Uh, the other thing to note is that the, with, the, with the design of the large communities in BGP, enabling it will not break any older BGP stacks that don't support it. They just won't do anything with them. So you should support large communities in your root servers by default. You should just do it because it won't break anyone else's stack, even if it doesn't support it. As I say, I think I think the vast majority of routers that peer at INEX, for example, all support large communities now. I think the main exception is probably uh, people using Mikrotik. I think they don't support large communities as of yet. Now, with large communities, we also get a bonus. So rather than being stuck with just uh, don't advertise to anyone, advertise to everyone, uh, don't advertise to this AS, advertise to this AS. Because we've got this triplet of information, we can now put, put more commands, make more stuff available in our large communities. So what, the other, the, the bonus one that IC Manager supports out of the box is ASPAT prepending. So if I wanted, as a root server client, if I wanted to prepend my ASPAT to a particular peer once, twice, or three times, I would tag it root server ASN colon 101 for once, two for twice, three for three times, and the peer AS. And that would have the root server advertise my prefix as normal to everybody else, but to prepend my AS one, two, or three times to whatever peer AS or ASs I had tagged uh, in, in the uh, large community. Uh, and then I've got an MB here at the bottom, and this is just a reminder that communities control the propagation of a client's routes to other clients. So when I, as a root server user, when I advertise my routes to the root server, I can use communities to control how the root server advertises those routes to all of the other networks. What, what they don't have any effect on is what the root server sends me. And that's because whatever routes I learn from the root server as a root server user, I still have full control over that. So I have to do my own filtering on any routes I learn. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Now, um, we're nearly at the end of the introduction. What, what I want to do before we get to the next uh, part two, where we're going to start actually deploying root servers, is I want to just give an introduction to how we have configured BIRD, the topology that we use within BIRD for creating uh, root server configurations. And we'll see this particular slide a few times over the next few presentations. Uh, you don't need to understand it all now, but by the end of this series, I think what we're going to talk about here will make complete sense, uh, but hopefully it will make some sense right now. Uh, so what we're looking at here, this green boxed area encompassing the three icons on the right, that is your 
your bird internals. That's that's what's happening inside your bird daemon. Your AS112 here is your root server client. They are a member of your exchange who are going to advertise roots into bird and receive roots out of it. So this is outside your root server and these three other elements are within your root server. So we need to learn roots from the client and the way we have configured bird is that every single client gets their own routing table in bird. So this routing table is just for AS112. It's not shared with anybody else. So when AS112 advertises their routes, we have this import filter that does all of the secure filtering, all of the stuff, the IRDB filtering, the RPKI, and all of the other checks that we do. Um, and if, if, it, if it doesn't like the route, it will still accept it into this routing table, but it will tag it so that it won't get through this pipe into the master routing table. We're only going to let good routes, routes that we want to share with other members into the master routing table, okay? The reason that we tag them and accept them rather than just rejecting them on entry is that we want to show our members telemetry like these are the prefixes that we are not passing on to other networks and this is the reason why. And that's why we need to bring them in here so that we can tag them with the appropriate error code and show them to the, the member later in the UI. Um, and then we only let routes through this pipe into the master routing table. So a, a pipe in BIRD is, is a way to import and export routes between two different routing tables. So this, this pipe from AS112's own routing table to the master just filters out all those tagged prefixes, those bad prefixes that we don't want, so only the good ones get through. Now, if you have a hundred clients on your root server, you have a hundred routing tables, a hundred client specific routing tables. There's only one master routing table. So all of the good routes eventually end up in the master routing table. And once they're in the master routing table, they get sent to all of the other clients. And the way they get sent, as we'll see, is they actually get sent back through the, all of the pipes, the hundred other pipes for all of the other clients. So AS112 advertises its prefixes to us. We filter them, tag anything bad, and we only let the good stuff into the master routing table. In reverse, exporting routes to a client, we've gotten all of these good routes from all of the other clients. They've all passed through the filter and passed through their own pipes. They're all in the master routing table. So now what we do is we pipe them into, we pipe them into the, the the, the AS112's own routing table so that we can export them to AS112. Now, as it goes through this pipe, this is actually where we apply the IX specific community filtering. Let's say a network down here had tagged their route and, it, and they tagged it zero colon 112, as in, I don't want this route sent to AS112. Well, as the, that route went through this pipe, that's checked. And if it was tagged zero colon 112, it would not get through the pipe. So only the routes that need that should get through this pipe end up here, and then they get exported as normal to the AS112, uh, to the client's BGP daemon. Uh, the strip root, root server tags here is because we do a lot of tagging as we'll see. We tag routes, even when the routes are good. So we tag routes when we learn them uh, to, to say we should filter these, but we also tag routes when they're good to say this is why we think they're good. And we show that information on the looking glass. So as we're sending the routes back out to the clients at the end of this chain, we need to strip out any tags that we added. Okay. So that is uh, the end of part one. That was the introduction. In the next one, we're going to actually look at configuring root servers with IXP Manager. Uh, just a few links here. Uh, and of course, thanks for watching. Um, we have our website, www.xpmanager.org, which is probably where you found this video. Really important website is docs.xpmanager.org. All of the stuff that I'm doing here is all documented there. Um, and particularly how to set up root servers is all documented there. What I also hope to probably do is write up these presentations in, in longer form uh, articles on my own blog, which you find at barrydonovan.com. If you want to reach out to me on Twitter, you can get me at barrio79. And my own email address is barry.odonovan at imex.ie. So again, thank you for watching. I hope that was useful uh, and we'll talk to you in the next session.